Hi everybody, this is Dino Chris from Prehistoric Facts, and we got our special episode today. So, the two animals that you guys actually decided to that were actually dis, that were actually picked was either was either the woolly mammoth or the saber tooth cat. And so, and right now the and the voting has has been concluded, and it shows that the saber tooth cat has won. So let's talk about the saber tooth cat. But in many ways, it like, but really, it is actually called um, Smilodon fatalis, which is the original saber tooth cat. And this is what Smilodon fatalis would actually look like. Now, there. Now, just to remind everybody that there is no such thing as a saber tooth tiger. The correct term is saber tooth cat. Because if it was a tiger, you would actually had stripes. But with saber-toothed cats, they're mainly spotted. They're pretty much spotted. It's because their environment would actually be more of like open areas, like like uh, some grassy uh, plains, and they would actually hunt in um, some edges of the forest edges of the forest too because you see that's how they actually would have actually used their camouflage just basically their fur would have been covered in spots and also it actually has a short tail which means it does not really turn very quickly and when it actually is trying to chase down prey so if it does try to chase down prey it would actually just uh, pretty much just tumble uh, to the ground because it's not really going to have a great effectiveness of, for chasing prey that much. But anyway, the size of Smilodon Fatalis is actually pretty much the same size as the modern male African lion. And, uh, and considering that it probably behaved almost like modern lions, it probably uh, hunted in, in, in packs or was in a group. Now, I wouldn't call it a pride necessarily. I would actually just pretty much call it a pack or a group. So they would pretty much hunt in groups. Now, the male and female would probably might have some differences, but it probably might be just either. Probably the males probably have a little more, um, a little fur on the, a little more fur on the neck area, kind of almost like modern lions. So that would probably be my best guess of how they actually pro how the males and females look differently. But even though they still have the same weapons, uh, they have the uh, sharp claws on their paws, and uh, they also would have those huge canines uh, coming out of their coming out of their coming out of their mouth, and and pretty much uh, saber tooth cats or smilodon. If you look at the jaw structure, it does look like it does give a very deadly bite, but it's not a very strong bite. So the lower jaw is very narrow and is small. So it's not really going to be designed to actually uh, suffocate the animals very well. And also it's not going to crush bone. So these animals are pretty much just trying to, trying to, um, pretty much to slice meat. That's all they're trying to do. But there's two different theories of how they actually use those saber teeth. Uh, those, use those saber teeth. One theory is that they actually bite the belly of the animal to actually create blood, to create a, a huge wound, and and actually let the prey bleed to death. But there's a but there's a but there's a, a flaw with this theory is that you just, when you look when you look at modern cats they don't when you look at most modern predators they don't go for the belly to get a kill to make the kill that's because you see if the prey is still alive then it would actually be it would actually be kicked the predator would be kicked to death so I would not actually suggest that that's how they actually use their saber teeth I don't think they actually use them like that because you see the teeth would get in the way also the big saber teeth would get in the way because you see it's it's how wide it can actually open its jaws the teeth get in the way if they actually try to bite the belly but the number one theory of how they actually use them is that they go at, go to the neck 
of the prey and actually either they actually use their saber teeth to probably just go through the neck area to they probably use their bite surgically pretty much they actually just take a very slow bite to the neck area and cut the blood vessels and also the jugular vein and also they can crush the wind windpipe with their back teeth and that would actually just kill the animal quickly and th in that way you don't make a lot of noise uh, to actually attract other predators to come and steal your kill and also that actually is very effective to actually uh, make the kill a lot quicker so it would actually be a lot more effective but even though for an animal like the saber-toothed cat it's very broad it's a broad muscular cat so it's not really going to be designed to chase down prey for a long distance kind of like you see cheetahs actually are very narrow and have that long tail and very long legs for uh, speed and agility but with lions and and some in most tigers they're not really designed to chase prey it's because they're only fast for a short distance so saber tooth cats would actually be done the same way they're ambush predators so they would pretty much just go at they would just pretty much just uh just uh, get close enough so that they can actually try to ambush the prey uh as as close as it can and then bang go after it with a quick burst of speed and then try to tackle it down and so it was these cats were pretty much were built like like bears because they were so broad on the shoulder region and also their hips were very strong too but we see injuries on the bones especially if you look for the fossil regions of these saber-toothed cats like smiling on fatalis they're actually found from north america all the way down to south america and um in the most famous fossil uh bed that is in north america is the La Brea tar pits and there is they have in its magnificent uh, fossilization and also the the bones are actually almost look like they were like like they were actually uh, there like about probably like a year ago so it's amazing how these fossils actually um, kind of came into be when they actually when these animals got stuck in that uh, in that um, asphalt soil and that and that is pretty much uh, how these animals pretty much died they get stuck uh, in that uh, oily s soil and they had no chance to get out it would have been a very slow painful death but it would but even though there is some distinct injuries uh, that we find on some uh, bones of some of these predators like in the hip region because there's hip because there's hip on the hip region there is there's one bone that has like a horrendous injury a lot of bone growth around the the socket of where the femur goes and it pretty much shows that there was a pulled muscle like a detached muscle from the hip and that it would have been a painful injury but it shows that this injury actually healed over time so it would actually uh, show that these animals do care for each other and also they actually um, when if they were in pretty much when they were in groups they would pretty much feed the injured animals uh, to take care of them and also get them healthy that way that they can actually be part of the hunt and all that but it would still slow them down due to the fact they probably had arthritis and on the region so they probably wouldn't have moved very efficiently so it would have been very tough for the for these animals now smilodon was actually around uh, like two million to ten to 11 to 10,000 years so it is pretty much that this was a a very effective predator but how it became extinct is a mystery because it is actually a lot of cases one ca one theory is that it was probably extinct due to the due to um, humans coming in and actually hunting down its prey that it normally captures but there's a but there's a flaw with this you see we humans don't actually uh, try to wipe out ones like every single animal that we actually hunt down we don't really do that 
because you see it would have been a, a huge amount of effort because there wasn't a big human population uh, back then around 11 to 10,000 years ago so it was pretty much um, that we because not I mean, even though uh, the humans did actually did hunt down mammoth they did hunt down the giant bison and um, and probably a little bit of the ground sloth but we were probably mainly going to go after like uh, like smaller animals that were probably less dangerous to actually tackle. It's because our what because the weapons that that were made at that time were pretty much designed to catch prey were designed to kill prey uh, that was actually uh, well suited for them to actually kill. But the number one theory I think would have been climate change and also uh, the prey species changing throughout time. And that's pretty much how it happened, is that um, that these saber-toothed cats are so effective, but also their asset, their those saber teeth, would have been its weakness, though, too. Because you see, sometimes your strengths be can become your weakness. And because it was actually a specialized predator, it could not try to tackle down uh, prey that was smaller than it. That, that was smaller than its original prey. Because if it tried to hunt down a rabbit, the teeth would get in the way. And that is pretty much how it, would, it probably would have happened, is that like the giant bison and some of the ground sloths and uh, some uh, uh, ancient horse and camel were pro and sometimes uh, baby mammoths and mastodons. Because since they were around that time, there would have been like very low numbers of that kind of prey and uh, and so those kinds of animals would so pretty much smile down would actually uh, starve to death and pretty much not adapt to the new environment as well and that would actually be the, the biggest case is that climate change pretty much just uh, was the catalyst of the of the extinction of the megafauna of uh, of North America and South America and Europe and and around uh, Russia and the Siberia area so that was pretty much how those kinds of animals got extinct and uh, I would but even though there are different species of uh, saber-toothed cat because because the saber-tooth uh, kind of gene pool actually actually stands kind of sticks around for 10, 10 million years then it stops and then it com comes back and then it stops and then it comes back again is like there's one uh, saber tooth cat that was smaller than Smilodon fatalis called Tenictus, when it was actually a small uh, uh, saber tooth cat, uh, still has those saber teeth, but was actually gonna more likely designed to tackle down like small hor like the ancient horses that were smaller than the original horses and also uh, smaller camels and that kind of that kind of uh, prey that would have been specialized to kill. But there are other kinds of saber tooth cats also. I can't name them all, but you know, since uh, how much time that we that we have left, but I would actually because since that these animals were really were very effective predators, but you never know the saber tooth cats could come back again because considering how how they actually have keeping keep evolving into this into this kind of fashion all over and over again. So because there is. Uh, a cat uh, in uh, Central America and parts of South America that actually does have those saber teeth, but it has very long, it has a uh, very long uh, upper lips, so that pretty much kind of covers them pretty well. But wouldn't be surprised that that animal, if that animal decides to cha change throughout time, we would actually see that animal does actually see that the teeth getting bigger, and also that cat getting bigger as well. As well. So it would probably tackle down much larger prey. So never know. Saber tooth cats could come back and throughout time. So if we did see saber tooth cat again, wouldn't be surprised that uh, it would still strike the fear in the hearts of all of us, considering that hey, we were around when uh, that cat was actually hunting down prey. But hey, we were we adapted around them, so we can. And I'm pretty sure it would adapt around us, but. We'll see how it goes throughout time. <laughs> All right, uh, that's it for now. Uh, 
Now just, now, just to remind you that next week's episode will be answering questions, and I already got like a bunch of battling questions from uh, one subscriber for this show. So, uh, but I mean, I will, I will take battling questions of prehistoric animals. It can't be just uh, modern day animals, though, too. So, I mean, I will take modern day animal battling questions, but I would actually prefer uh, prehistoric animal battle questions. It's all based on my opinion. It's not really pretty much how it actually is going to happen. So. But I mean, you can still uh, send me questions about, uh, but even though if you have a question about dinosaurs or any other prehistoric life, but mainly vertebrate animals, uh, feel free to post it on the Facebook fan page, Prehistoric Facts with Dino Chris. And also, um, you can email it to me at dinochris71 at gmail.com. And also, you can follow me on Twitter and uh, at C S Grawl, which is C S G R A L L. So feel free to follow me on on Twitter, and also uh, follow the fan page too. Follow the fan page, Prehistoric Facts with Dino Chris, and uh, you can post your questions there, and I can answer those for you on the on Facebook. I mean, I have no problem taking questions on Facebook. Doesn't always have to be on email, but I just figured that this would actually give a, a much broader area that I can actually answer some questions. But also, remember to leave your first name and where you're from on an email, but on a Facebook post, make sure to leave where you're from so that I can actually find out where this question, where the questions are coming from and basi basically on where you're from. So that way I can actually get to know you guys. So that would actually, uh, so that way I can connect to the audience out there. But <clears throat> anyway, so uh, feel free to send those questions. So I got, so I got plenty of time to. Ha so you got plenty of time before the next week, next Saturday's episode. So anyway, so make sure to take care of the people around you, and also for your younger kids out there, make sure to listen to your teachers, your parents, and your guardians, because those are the best motivation you can have for good education. And it's very important to have a very good education. Anyway, that's it for now, and I'll see you guys next week.